working with the city limits now for about eight years, and it's gone through a transformation that has really given it a, a real meaning uh, in the city of New York. Every one of the programs that we go after are done by no one else. And this is really the thought behind city limits, is that as the media world changes and shrinks, the traditional media are no longer able financially to report on things that mean a lot to the people of New York. And that's the job of City Limits. So I want to welcome you all to this event. I want to thank you for your support. It means a lot to all of us. And I now want to introduce the Editor-in-Chief and the CEO of City Limits, Jarrett Murphy. I'm especially grateful to Wayne and Henry for letting us honor them tonight. Uh, we picked them for a lot of reasons, but chiefly because we admire them. And it's said that you admire people uh, because you, rep you recognize something in them that you think you have or you hope you have or you would like to possess, some trait. And I'll admit that that is true tonight of our honorees and of city limits. Uh, the courage of one's convictions, uh, dedication to doing the kind of grunt work that it takes to do good, uh, commitment to the city, a deep belief in democracy, and a willingness, or some might even say a thirst, for making the right kind of enemies. Uh, those are among the qualities that we celebrate in our honorees tonight, and they're among the traits that City Limits has tried to exhibit during its four decades of existence. And it was a fight for survival, and it was that fight that City Limits was founded to cover. Not just to cover, but to take part in. Uh, to use the power of media to discover, to inform, to expose, and to embarrass in a hope that we might tilt ever so slightly the balance of power in the city toward the Bushwicks and Hunts Points and Ravenwood Houses of the world. And that's exactly what we've done over 40 years, and that's what we're celebrating this evening. But it can also be very lonely when you start out to do a, a story uh, that hasn't exactly galvanized the rest of the city yet. And so, a, a real kinship is formed when you find somebody who cares almost as much like as you, maybe even more so, about a, an incredibly obscure uh, issue. And so more than 10 years ago, when I set out to do some reporting about outsourcing in the city, I found a young DC 37 uh, official named Henry Garrido, who had put together some very good white papers on the impacts of privatization on New York. It wasn't unusual to find a union official who didn't like outsourcing. It was unusual to find anybody who had done really good research, and that was Henry. Thank you, Jared and Mark, and congratulations uh, to the City Limits Board and all of your staff for 40 years of providing the city with social justice journalism. Your work is critical to policymakers, and it provides something that's very different and new and very, very needed, and that is your investigative reporting, but also a perspective um, that often isn't heard and that elected officials could then help um, galvanize and, and, and wrap around policy. Uh, President Ford told the city to drop that, and this publication was born a year later. Uh, and since then, it has become the champion publication for those who otherwise wouldn't have a voice. Um, today, I stand with you honor as the representing working people in New York, 125,000 members and about 50,000 retirees and their families, which together represent a total of 387,000 New Yorkers in the city of New York. Now, I'm going to bear a little bit more my scrap a little bit because today I think is a moment for us to take a moment and pause. You know, maybe it's because we're here. Maybe it's because I studied architecture that I was in awe when I first walked up and look at the beautiful buildings around it and beautiful models and all the, 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 the work that I can imagine went into this city. But if there's one thing I learned 15 years ago when September 11 took place, that as people were running away from that pit you see over there, city workers was running towards it. They were sacrificing the safety and the lives to protect and defend the people that were in that pit. And we should never forget that 15 years later, many of them are still dying, they're sick, and we should be doing everything we can to protect their lives and to make sure their health is taken care of. 
that is important for a publication of acidic limits that have for many years spoken for those who cannot speak for themselves, the immigrants, the people are struggling to get fair housing in this city uh, for institutional corruption, which is one, that one of my favorite subjects that Wayne wrote a lot about, that we take a moment to say that it is really, really important that we empower and talk to people about a set of ideals, not just a set of candidates, so we can continue to move this country for on behalf of my members who make it possible for me to be here and be at work every day I thank you and I am honored for this award to to my life and to Wayne's life and career and also to the life of City Limits uh, Tom yeah. Robbins was editor of City Limits <laughs> ah. <laughs> Tom Robbins was the editor of City Limits in the uh, early 1980s a time when uh, this publication really established itself as an independent voice, and you all know the story from there, the Daily News, Village Voice, uh, Books, CUNY Grad School, amazing stuff for the Marshall Project. Um, wherever he's been and whatever he's done, uh, he has always been an unfailingly decent and courageous voice for justice, and so it's a true privilege to introduce my friend Tom Robbins. That's longer than I was going to say about this guy. My goodness, thank you, Jerry. Congratulations, Henry Garrido, for this honor. I, I got to pay my homage first. I haven't had a chance. One second, folks. Aww. Within a few years, they were living in Brownsville, helping to expose corrupt politicians who were feasting off one of the city's poorest communities. And that was when Wayne started writing for the Village Voice and he unleashed a torrent of words and articles that went on for the next 35 years, and I do mean a torrent. There was a lot of stories and a lot of articles. While there, he continued his streak of identifying great politicians, and he co-authored a book with the late great Jack Newfield called City for Sale, about the scandals of the Koch administration. A great book. The hero of the book was a guy named Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> and as mayor, after Wayne helped him get elected, the man was a major disappointment to Wayne, as he was to a few other New Yorkers. To set the record straight, Wayne then set out to write not one, but two books. Danny Collins, sitting here, suffered with him through the second one about 9-11. But the first one, never get Wayne mad or disappointed. He managed to send one of those fabulous Barrett interns up to Sing Sing to discover that Giuliani's father, Harold, had been a mob enforcer back in the 1950s. You know, something that, I mean, that was the end of Giuliani's presidential prospects right there. I'd like to say a few words of real thanks and a few words about the state of journalism. <sighs> Thanks, first of all, to Fran, the editor of my life for over 50 years. <laughs> thanks, to the, thanks to the best story Fran and I ever co-bylined, Mac. Thanks to my departed brother, Jack, my tour guide to the tawdry, who dispatched, who dispatched me to cover Kid Trump way back in the 70s. Thanks to my other voice colleagues, several of whom are here tonight. We thought a deadline meant we had to kill somebody by closing time. <laughs> Thanks to my army of interns, the soldiers of detail, who taught me so much. In other words, you all have accomplished something. <laughs> uh, 
and thanks to city limits, born four decades ago, to combat, to combat the Trump of that day, Roger Starr. <laughs> Lastly, a few words about journalism and tonight's debate. As usual, Springsteen got the campaign best in Badlands, which now describes large swaths of America. Poor man want to be rich, rich man want to be king, and king ain't satisfied till he rules everything. Newt Gingrich and Kellyanne Conway said today that Trump is the Babe Ruth of debating. Maybe that's what they mean about when America was great before. He's certainly not the Hank Aaron of debating. Since Donald's rise, I've had over 60 journalists, Tom referred to this, visit me in Brooklyn. Many have plumbed the cavern of Trump files in my basement. Almost every major print outlet has come, a dozen TV crews, but few of them have been American. There have been many fine pieces of investigative reporting about Trump, but they have gotten almost no TV airtime, the oxygen of presidential politics. Michael Cruz, for example, did a stunning piece in Politico on 9-11 that revealed that Trump went on a New York TV station that day 15 years ago, and with the bodies still filling our streets, pointed out that his building, 40 Worth Street, was now the tallest built building downtown. He wasn't even right. <laughs> I thought this had to be top TV news, but Hillary stumbled getting into an SUV, and in the week, of pneumonia coverage that followed Trump's self-promotion on America's darkest day disappeared. Give them what they want is now the underpinning to the TV narrative. When Mac was in elementary school, I was asked to speak at his school about what reporters do. And I brought my notebook I had it in the pocket of my trench coat, and these were fifth and sixth graders, and it was an auditorium filled with them. And I said, we are detectives for the people. 